Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today. I'm just going to share screen. So yeah, um, it's a real delight to be hosting a webinar today from the New Economy Network Australia, um, featuring Hamed Hosseini, talking about reimagining the good life, a pluriversal perspective um, of community well-being in Australia. Um, so first I'd like to acknowledge country, I'd like to acknowledge that I personally live, work and play on the traditional lands of the Cubby Cubby people. I'm here in Narangba, which is north of Brisbane, and the country that I live on, some of the view there, the beautiful uh, Glasshouse Mountains, um, the country I live on also connects to the Jinnaburra traditional custodians land. So I'd like to acknowledge um, all the first peoples of this continent and any Indigenous peoples speak joining us today. And I'd also like to acknowledge the important role that we all play in understanding the history of our place and hopefully playing a part in decolonizing the way we think about Australia, the way we think about um, caring for country and the way we think about our future role together as uh, peoples living on this continent. Um, sorry, that's the map of where I live. And um, yeah, that's the map showing where I live using the Aboriginal map of Australia. Um, and yeah, just want to acknowledge all the first peoples of this continent and acknowledge that land was never ceded, um, that we still continue to live on stolen lands. Um, what I'd like to do before I introduce Hamed's work is uh, just tell you a little bit about the New Economy Network Australia or NINA. Uh, NINA was created back in 2016, 2017 as a really fantastic network, um, a growing network of individuals and organisations who are keen to create an ecologically healthy and socially just society um, by focusing on Australia's economic system. Um, so NINA is run entirely by volunteers, has a board of directors, uh, it's registered as a cooperative, um, but we also have some really fantastic ways for people to get involved with NINA, including through our distributed governance network. So if you ever wanna know more about how we work, um, in the About Us, you'll find a little bit about our governance and the fact that we have lots of different hubs um, that can connect people with their own diverse interests into the broader network. Uh, Nina's had a quiet year because of um, everyone being incredibly busy, um, but next year we're excited to be hosting the next New Economy Conference in Brisbane in 2025. It will be probably in the last few months of next year. We have yet to set a date and to lock in all those plans. Um, but if you have a look on the website one day, please do check out the, the Nina Journal. Um, there's a vast array of uh, recorded events, webinars and things that we've hosted and lots of other information. And if you wanna get involved or you wanna become a member, uh, please check out the website or send us an email. That would be fabulous. Um, but what I wanted to do now was just mention um, that Hamed and myself worked together to create uh, an MOU uh, between uh, Hamed's university and the New Economy Network Australia to carry out a range of research projects and activities. And so we're really excited um, to be having Hamed talk today about his research project, um, which continues, and his interests uh, in looking at well-being continue too. So Without further ado, um, I'm really excited to uh, listen to Hamed's talk. Uh, over to you, Hamed. Thank you. Uh, well, um, uh, thank you, Michelle, for your very insightful introduction and uh, uh, for leading the, um, the the session today. Um, and, and of course, hosting it. Um, um, I'm also thrilled to see so many people actually here. So far, we have about 92 attendees, and I hope you will stay with us until the end. Um, I have a lot to share. So um, uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's dive right in. Yeah, well, um, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I, uh, as Michelle mentioned, my name is uh, Hamid Hosseini. Uh, I'm a sociologist uh, working at the University of Newcastle um, and uh, speaking to you from uh, the unceded Aboriginal lands of the Awabakal and Waramai peoples. Uh, I'm very thrilled to be here today to present the very uh, first findings 
from a research project my academic team and uh, I conducted uh, in partnership with uh, New Economy Network Australia, Nina, in, in 2021. The project was based on a kind of a nationwide social survey uh, and 15, 14 in-depth uh, in interviews with uh, some civil society, a sample of civil society and grassroots organizations across Australia. So um, um, all of them were kind of a pro, uh, involved in progressive change. So um, our research uh, focused mostly on their perception of, uh, of a good life um, alongside several other key topics, including their theories of change, their ideologies or ideological views, the scale and the scope um, and the lens of their work, um, their, their positions um, on, on critical topics or issues and the goal, their goals and their functions, um, as well as um, uh, um, the means they use to to achieve those goals um, and a number of other things. Um, so I know we have a diverse group of, um, of attendees today uh, and I'm very aware that catering to everyone's preferences can be a little bit tricky. Some parts of the presentation might feel a little bit dense for some um, and others might find those sections a little bit interesting or not interesting or vice versa. So in, in if, if one part doesn't grab your your attention or interest, uh, please don't worry. Uh, there's likely another coming up that will. Um, so um, for activists, for instance, here, there are political elements that might resonate um, for students and learners. There is uh, educational content and for the um, uh, ac uh, fellow academics, well, don't worry. Uh, there is some theory uh, too, so uh, this may take about 60 minutes, I'm afraid to say, so I really appreciate your patience. So we'll finish with a Q&A at the end, and my colleagues um, um, will keeping uh, an eye on the chart, uh, on the, uh, sorry, chat room uh, for your questions and the, and the comments. So I'll try to keep things clear and accessible, uh, but I might miss a few uh, finer details here and there. So this is the first time we're sharing the findings and your thoughts will help us um, improve. Um, and also, also very fitting that this is part of the Social Sciences Week, which is about making social sciences more engaging uh, for the broader audience. So in that spirit, I'm um, stepping away from the usual academic, you know, the boring academic format to keep things a little bit uh, more fresh and uh, hopefully more engaging. Um, well, um, um, academic presentations usually start by going over the research details, objectives, methodologies, the context, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's important. But I want to keep the focus on the core insights today. So here is a quick slide with the background of the project for anyone interested in the specifics like the methodology or fundings, et cetera, et cetera. I'll, I'll share links under the uh, recorded session on YouTube for you to, to check out later. Um, uh, here, I only just uh, uh, want to give a very big thank you to everyone who made this possible. Nina as our community partner, the research team, um, more than 100 uh, organizations or participants uh, who took our survey and um, and uh, accepted our invitation for the interviews, interviews and the College of Human and uh, Social Futures at the University of Newcastle at, uh, that funded the project. Um, okay, well, let's get straight to the heart of uh, today's discussion. I want to start with a question that it'll get you thinking and help focus um, uh, the topics. The question is this, uh, how would you or how would we define a good life for our local community, for a society where um, us, our communities, and many interconnected communities coexist? Or in other words, what are the essential elements that make up a good quality of life for, for everyone, your neighbors, families, businesses, you know, 
uh, schools, even natural environment that supports it all. So we don't have, unfortunately, time for a full discussion here, I'm afraid. But let's consider the kinds of answers we might expect to hear when we raise such a question, right? So many would mention tangible things that would improve overall community well-being, like wealth, I don't know, economic growth, uh, or good public services, uh, prosperity, jobs, um, uh, political participation, maybe, and, and, and a healthy environment. Others uh, might uh, highlight more subjective elements like satisfaction, um, um, happiness, uh, mental well-being, or, or even a spiritual uh, fulfillment, peaceful coexistence, or, or dignity. And these are um, harder to measure, uh, but just as vital in shaping our um, idea of a good life. Um, so, but if you think about it, these elements that I just uh, mentioned are the same ones we often see in official social indexes, like you know the Human Development Index, you know, OECD uh, Be Better Life Index, or Happiness Rankings, and and the like. And they focus on the availability of material and non-material conditions at an acceptable uh, standard or level. But, but here's the thing. I mean, these indexes measure the outcomes, not how a society actually gets there or achieves them. So they focus on what people and communities have or want to have. Uh, and, but not about how they achieve it, and not the process behind it. So here is a more critical question I think we need to, um, to raise, and that is what enables a society to achieve these conditions, these conditions of good life, in a way that is effective, sustainable, and moral? And, and how does, or, or how does a society you know, just accumulate wealth or even happiness, but create a system where these conditions are equitable and enduring. So I mean, this, this kind of question actually shifts our focus from the what question to a how question, or even to a why question, why we, why we think this is good for a society. So the, uh, the answers to the second question, um, uh, you know, how we achieve and sustain conditions of good life, are going to be very different to the answers to the first question. Um, so it is no longer just about wealth or happiness as the end products, but about the processes that lead to them, um, and importantly, uh, the legitimacy of those processes. Uh, let me clarify. Um, imagine a country with high income, strong um, economic growth, uh, uh, a high standard of living, healthcare, education, leisure for, for, for many. Uh, well, on the surface, it looks great, but dig deeper and, uh, and you find much of this wealth relies on, um, on unequal relationships with poorer countries, you know, through unfair trade, you know, cheap resource extraction and low wage labor. I mean, this is not really, that scenario is not really alien to us. We, we're, we're very familiar with that. So yes, many in that country or society enjoy a good life, but inequality between classes or so, or genders and ethnic groups, even within that society are growing and people are disconnected from how value is created and that would lead to a sense of growingly the sense of powerlessness and resentment and um, and uh, disenfranchisement. So well, this good life has two major problems, obviously. First, it's um, ethically shaky because it's built on exploiting marginalized groups, you know, both abroad and at home. And usually the same systems that drive inequality overseas are the same as the ones that drive inequality inside. And a second problem is that it's unsustainable. I mean, for, 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 for very obvious reason that rising inequality undermines justice um, and, uh, and infinitely pushing for 
economic growth, you know, really depletes um, resources and causes environmental destructions and finally worsens the climate crisis. Um, so uh, so th that's why a more important question than what constitutes a good life is what enables a society to secure a good life in ways that are morally right and, uh, and balanced, both so so socially and ecologically. And this was the very big question we uh, asked ourselves in 2020, when the timing was really a key. Uh, COVID-19 hit, turning the world upside down, forcing us to think seriously about the future, not just for humans, um, but for all life on the planet. Um, and meanwhile, I mean, climate change had been worsening for years, you know, hitting different uh, regions unevenly. And life as we know it has never been um, under such an assault, under such pressure from so many directions. So of course we're not the first group to ask this. It's been debated maybe for centuries in terms of what uh, what results in good life, and and many of us are still figuring it out. You know, trying to build a better life. And we also know that the economic policies and political decisions are are shaped by different ideas of the good life. Uh, so we shouldn't really underestimate such ideas. If a society values, let's say individual uh, prosperity and freedom of choice when its uh, policies will favor market and um, and personal uh, liberty um, it, if, if the focus is on social justice then there will be more emphasis on redistribution welfare collective well-being and as we know um these these approaches uh, uh, you know policy approaches uh, are always shaped uh, by power and are constantly pulling in different directions. Now, um, there has always been a struggle over what a, a good life means and, and how to achieve it. And after the 2008 global financial crisis, some movements regained momentum to push beyond GDP, by taking account of, of, of social equity and ecological well-being. And some have been working through projects, their own projects and social innovation and others focus um, on education and, uh, and, and policy influences. With so many approaches out there, it's essential um, we felt that to, to, to map and understand how their perspectives converge or diverge. Um, for, for a long time, I would say the elite, the um, the establishments, if you like, uh, with control over the media, education, and think tanks, they have shaped the narratives around uh, good life. Every, every uh, everyday people, you know, despite having rich experiences and ideas, often go unheard. I mean, they actually lack the necessary platforms, time, and resources to develop and express their views. So. Uh, this is where grassroots and civil society act, um, actors and movements come in. Um, on the one hand, they have they they're connected to their uh, communities, and on the other hand, they they uh, they engage with the elite institutions to to promote uh, uh, their new ideas of progress. So, but they are often uh, also underfunded and underheard, and they normally struggle to push their um, ideas forward. So this is why a project like this that maps and amplifies views to, to themselves and to the public could be so powerful. I mean, it can connect fragmented perspectives, it can uh, strengthen uh, their collective voice and it can highlight the alternative visions they, they fight for. So it helps them articulate their own um, ideas and learn from each other. So uh, with this um, in mind, uh, we saw um, the civil society actors and grassroots activists as, uh, as, uh, as a perfect group to, to help us map perspectives and a good life. And we invited over 500 potential respondents from uh, uh, progressive uh, groups across Australia. And our goal was to dig deeper into how they see the good life and, and the processes they believe 
would lead to it. So, but due to COVID-19 lockdowns in 2021, uh, we got responses from 106 participants and after filtering the incomplete submissions, we, we had a final data set of 96 respondents uh, measuring 359 uh, variables to, to analyze. So now um, I know 96 might not sound like a lot, but it gave us valuable insight, especially for a pilot study like this. Uh, and our aim was to test the methodology, not get a fully representative sample. But this data was still useful and sufficient uh, for a scaling up. Um, so when selecting the organizations, we focus on uh, progressive uh, civil society groups that push for, I would say, systemic change. And we check their websites and use the uh, our, our team's um, knowledge to, to see if they were actively um, engage in areas that are um, aligned with, uh, with with our goals. So we targeted groups that um, uh, focused them um, uh, on ecological health, you know, making it better, uh, public well-being, social justice, so those working to protect the environment, you know, improve community welfare, reduce inequality, advocate for marginalized groups. Uh, we also included those working to make the economy more participatory for, by promoting cooperatives or, or being a cooperative, uh, community wealth building or social enterprises and those activate, uh, sorry, advocating for economic redistribution. So, and finally, we, we included uh, uh, groups um, that were kind of committed to the decolonization and indigenous well-being. Uh, so these were the kind of criteria we used um, uh, in order to um, uh, select um, um, uh, our sample and invite people um, and include them in the sample. Um, so just to give you an overview that um, uh, who finally took part, well, the pie graph on the uh, right-hand side shows the percentages of the respondents based on their uh, the ultimate outcomes they were aiming for. And the bar graph uh, on the left hand side shows the main roles they see themselves playing in their, their performance. So, for example, 9% of them listed decolonization as their um, top outcome. And, you know, in the, as you can see in that um, uh, pie graph, um, and 27% uh, 20, um, our focus on ecological health and so on and so forth. On the left-hand side, the top bar, for instance, represents the percentage of the respondents focused on network and community building, which makes up the largest portion. This is followed by those who serve um, um, as service providers, the second uh, top bar. Um, a smaller portion focused on policy influence and, uh, and the rest are engaged in discourse or uh, or or uh, or knowledge making as their primary function, uh, but uh, here is where it gets a little bit tricky. Many of the respondents picked up uh, more than one option for their goals and and functions. So that's why when you add up those percentages, um, it goes above hundred percent. And and the thing is that basic pie charts or bar charts like these just can't really capture that complexity when people are given the um, choice to 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 take more than one option. Um, so these these graphs don't really show which organization picked which answers and how their um, answers actually overlap. That's that's where social network analysis and visualization can really help. So many people think um, social network analysis is just for mapping the actually existing physical connections between groups or individuals, but that's not the case. I mean there are many interesting ways of making uh, good use of them. So for example, um, I used uh, Kumu's, um, um, it's a website, um, uh, interactive ba based uh, platform to map out the organizations uh, we surveyed. And it gives us a much clearer picture of, of how their goals and functions are, uh, are shared or, or, or you may say connected. So here's an image of that, um, uh, that website. Um, 
Um, it's uh, it's not interactive here, unfortunately. This is just an uh, image uh, and a screenshot. So in this case, we we've got as you can see uh, in that um, uh, visualization network visualization, we've got two types of nodes. Um, you know the the little circles. You know uh, they represent the organizations themselves, and then names are uh, written below each one of those dots or nodes. Um, and um, um, and also you see the type of the nodes that are the, the, the second type of the nodes that are larger in the, the purple ones or the blue ones, the larger ones in the in the middle, um, that they show the ultimate outcomes these organizations uh, are working towards. So um, the size of each each circle, the purple circles, uh, corresponds to the, the number of respondents that pick that outcome. So the larger the purple circle is, the more organizations pursue that. They are connected to it. The more organizations are connected or pursue that. And uh, what's really cool is that the uh, that you can actually kill, click on any any node, whether organizations or the out, um, output. Um, and to see not only what each organization is aiming for, but but also how they align with other organizations that have the similar goals. Um, so the nodes have some extra features. Um, as you can see, their 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 shape. You know, if that's a circle or or a square or or a pentagon or whatever, their shape shows their geographical scope, and the color coded rings around them highlights what type of explicit um, positions they have indoors. So on the left-hand side of the map, under the legend, you can see the list of colors in, and shapes and their related uh, descriptions or qualities. So there are also uh, buttons down there that, um, that uh, by clicking on them, you can filter uh, the view so you can easily zoom in on some specific groups. For instance, you only want to see uh, the co-ops or the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, initiatives. Um, so for instance, um, um, uh, as in this image, uh, yeah, uh, um, we, we, we search for an organi uh, organization like Nina. So I search for Nina and um, it uh, it shows up and then you click on it and you can actually isolate it from the rest of the network and see what goals um, um, it pursues. Uh, and um, in, the, in this case, you see that there are four goals um, and uh, what explicit positions uh, it endorses, you know, according to those colorful uh, rings around it uh, and what geographical scope um, and what type of organization um, it, it is, or what geographical scope it uh, it has, and what type of organization it is. In this case, it's a pentagon, and according to the legend, it means that Nina uh, Nina's geographical scope is national. So similarly, we can uh, uh, click um, on any one of those purple circles, the the uh, the pursued outcomes or the ultimate outcomes or outputs. Uh, for instance, I clicked on decolonization, and I took an image of that. And we, you can see it, it is now isolated from the rest of the network. So you can clearly see what organizations uh, pursue that goal. And that's the, the, the organizations that are connected to, to, that, uh, to that goal or that, um, that node. Um, so uh, once we share the link in, in, in the chat room, and I uh, really encourage you all, especially those of you who took the survey, um, to later on after maybe after the session, explore the network. As I said, you can search for your own organization uh, or any organization you're interested and see which um, 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 uh, other organizations um, share your goals, strategies and functions. And it's really cool once you start playing around with it and I think you will find it uh, super useful. If um, if you find enough time, I will quickly show you how it works. You know, after, uh, after the Q and A, if we find enough time, but there is many more of such maps for for many different purposes, and and we share the links to them below the uh, YouTube recording of the of the webinar. Hopefully, well, now you might rightfully ask, 
how we explored our respondents' perception of good life, uh, which was the primary focus of this project. And our aim was to give more visibility to their views and help their voices be heard and gather insights that can, can actually inform policy, practice, and, and politics. At the core of our survey was something many of you might have seen before, even if you don't know the name. The name is uh, uh, the Likert scale, not Likert, the Likert scale. And it's a way to measure people's views on complex issues, you know, by asking them to rate their agreement or disagreement with a number of statements. Um, and uh, why do we use such a scales in social sciences, you may ask, because social issues are very multidimensional and, and uh, one uh, question normally can't capture the full picture. And take the example of job satisfaction, right? So you, you wouldn't just ask them, are you happy with your job? You know, jobs have multiple aspects, many aspects in, to them, the, 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 the pay, the workload, the management, the relationship. So we ask, we normally ask multiple questions for a more complete view. So when it comes to something as complex as uh, processes behind a good life uh, and people's perception of that, it, it it's even gets more challenging. So it's not just about income or or resources, but also about communities um, um, and how communities organize, you know, um, or foster well-being and, and, and promote freedom and et cetera, et cetera. So in our survey, we use multiple statements, to be accurate, 22 statements to explore how our transformative civil society participants see the pathways to a truly good life. Um, so each statement captured a different piece, uh, you know, whether it was economic, social, political, ecological, uh, and um, and uh, to, to give us a much clearer picture of what people value most and what they see as, um, as, uh, as key to creating a thriving and just society. So, um, for instance, in this image, um, uh, as you can see, um, we have given our respondents a, a range of statements about quality of life, and they were asked to indicate how important each of these 22 items or statements uh, should be in defining uh, quality of life or good quality of life of, the, of, of communities. And the options range from, uh, for each statement range from extremely important to not, Im not important um, at all. Um, and, uh, and then depending on the options um, the, the, the respondents choose um, or every respondent chooses for each a statement, they get a, a score from one to five, you know, one for not at, not at all important and five for, for extremely important. And then uh, the more people think of a statement as a more important, the higher the score is going to be for that a statement. So there is um, unfortunately not enough space here to show you all the statements, but you will find them later in some slides in full. So this kind of a structure that we call scale um, helps us to actually capture the, uh, the varying degrees um, of emphasis respondents placed on each factor uh, or aspect um, by providing insight into the, the to the uh, collective priorities and visions for a good life. Now, you may ask um, me where do these statements actually come from. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to uh, designing such a scales, we uh, partly or even sometimes primarily rely on existing uh, literature. And often we also consult with our uh, partners and discuss our options with other experts and, and, and co-develop such a scales uh, with, uh, with a group of potential participants and then pilot it, uh, pilot them and then refine them uh, for the final use. Um, so with respect to the literature, um, as the source of insight for designing the statements in, in, the, in that kind of a scale, there is no shortage of well-articulated ideas. You know, philosophers, theologians, and thinkers from all corners of the world, uh, from ancient Greece to, to the Middle East and through 
European and Islamic medieval thought, they will have debated uh, this for, for centuries. And, and the conversation then uh, significantly shifted during the uh, so-called European Enlightenment. And, and that's what eventually led to modern ways of evaluating quality of life today. So for me, uh, mapping out these uh, perspectives has been uh, fascinating in, in, in recent years, especially since 2016. But I wanted to push it further. Um, and in my open access paper, you can see an image of that on the on the screen. The, the well-living uh, uh, paradigm um, was the title of the paper published um, in 2023 last year. Uh, I dug into these um, uh, historical ideas and took them uh, in a new and more radical direction. And if you're curious, I'd recommend checking it out for for deeper look um, at what I call a, a communist perspective on what a good uh, communal life really uh, uh, looks like. So if, if interested, there is also a handbook like this one. This is not uh, written by me. Um, uh, that it can even um, give you much a much more uh, 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 a detailed uh, uh, description of those ideological and philosophical arguments around the topic. So I won't get too deep, uh, uh, but it's worth mentioning a few uh, traditions intellectual traditions that still shape how people think about the good life and um, uh, which we also, as I will show you later, we found uh, being reflected in, in the responses that we received from our respondents. Um, so first, um, there is a, the, a tradition called uh, eudaimonia, eudaimonia uh, or virtue ethics, which is about achieving good life by cultivating virtues like wisdom, uh, courage, justice, and thinkers like Aristotle and the Stoics believed happiness comes from developing characters uh, and, and living according to reason with a focus on, I would say, moral growth and, uh, and contributing to the community or even looking after the environment. So then there is a hedonistic tradition or hedonism, which is about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain but but um, through simple moderate pleasures that that uh, that bring peace of mind because they realize too much pressures would be uh, too much ple pleasure would be problematic. So we also have pre-modern communitarian cultures and religious traditions, you know, where the good life is tied to communal solidarity and following moral or divine laws. And it's a it's a mixed approach. Some traditions are more authoritative. Uh, while others uh, like Sufism, or you could say Sufisms, or Buddhisms, or indigenous cultures, they will emphasize uh, balance. In, in many indigenous cultures, the good life is ideally about living in harmony with nature and the community, you know, guided by, I would say, a spiritual and ancestral wisdom, you know, uh, embedded in their rituals and their individual's well-being is, is seen uh, as, uh, as inseparable from the well-being of the community and the environment. Then we've got the European Enlightenment um, that brought a major shift by focusing on secular and, and rationalist ideas by framing a good life around individual rights and social contracts. For example, uh, Thomas Hobbes argued the individuals should surrender certain freedoms to a powerful sovereign in, in exchange for protection and, and, and order. Without this kind of agreement, he said, life would be nasty, brutish, and short. And then opposite to him is, the, is another philosopher of enlightenment, the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, it saw humans as naturally good. He was kind of more optimistic and, and believed society should reflect the collective will and allow individuals to flourish. And for Rousseau, the good life came through um, democratic participation and shaping the rules to benefit the, 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 the common good. Now, in the modern era, the idea of good life became more closely linked to economic success and individual achievement, especially under capitalist and neoliberal frameworks, you know, liberal 
hedonism and utilitarianism fo focus on maximizing uh, happiness or pleasure for the greatest number of people. And thinkers like Bentham and Mill argued that uh, pleasure, especially intellectual pleasure, could be measured and boosted through rational policies and and through markets. And um, then, then we've got new liberal capitalism in recent decades that um, that takes a much more reductionist approach by conflating the good life with economic growth, consumerism, and, and personal responsibility. You may remember Tony Abbott saying homelessness is a personal choice. And success here is measured by how well you compete in the market and achieve financial um, independence. Well, this, this view pushes for free markets and, and minimal state involvement, but it uh, often ignores the social and ecological cost, uh, which uh, leads to uh, rising, of course, inequality and environmental damage and climate change. Uh, so in response to neoliberal uh, reductionism, we also have seen the rise of, especially more recently, reformist uh, voices or, or approaches that uh, redefine good life by including social and environmental concerns. For example, the, the Beyond GDP movement or uh, well-being economy uh, perspectives all argue that quality of life should reflect um, social equity, environmental sustainability, and overall well-being, and not just GDP. Uh, but such perspectives uh, broaden, uh, broaden uh, their idea of well-being, but, but they often fail to challenge the core capitalist uh, structures that shape the society. So um, besides them, we also have more radical voices. You know, more recently, again, we've got movements like uh, eco-socialism, eco-feminism, eco-anarchism, um, indigenous movements in the global south, even the Black Lives Matter movement in the global north, they have inspired new ideas about good life and their visions of alternative futures are grounded in, in systemic criticism and the analysis of their status quo rather than just surface level reforms or, or simply following um, what, uh, what Marx and Engels uh, uh, diagnosed or criti critiqued as utopian socialism. So in, in my works, um, you know the, the well living paradigm that I introduced earlier to you, the paper, and and uh, and on and also this book, Capital Redefined, uh, with uh, with my friend uh, uh, Professor Gilds, I've captured the essence of these movements to build a common theoretical foundation known as the Communist Framework, so, which is a framework that unifies the diverse approaches, especially the radical ones, um, and offer a, a vision of the good life that moves beyond capitalism. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the details of that, but I wish to invite uh, those of you who are interested to have a look at that. Both uh, the paper and the, and, and, the, and the book are open access and they are available online. So, all right, let's, uh, let's get into the data we gathered using the so-called uh, Likert scale. And in this bar, uh, bar chart, um, you can see the 22 statements listed uh, on the left hand side of the of the graph uh, or, or the image and the length of each blue uh, bar against each statement shows how much emphasis our respondents have placed on each statement. And so instead of uh, uh, agreeing or disagreeing, as you may remember, they were asked to rate how important each statement was to their idea of good life. So there's a statistical test called one sample t-test, yeah, mouthful, but that, but we use that to compare each statement's average score to the middle of the scale that signifies a moderate position on each statement. So the blue bars on the right of the zero, the zero in, uh, scale in the middle of the scale, uh, so the blue, bar, the blue bars on the right-hand side of the scale um, uh, show the how it, uh, the higher level of importance uh, that is placed on each statement. So the, the further right the bar is, the blue bar is, the, the more strongly uh, the respondents emphasized it. Uh, and bars on the left of zero um, or the middle uh, 
show that respondents placed little to no importance on those statements. So we see a strong emphasis on things like biodiversity, the very top one, uh, as you can see, community solidarity, the, the connection to nature, and those bars stretch well to the right. And the, uh, on the other hand, down the bottom, uh, you see the statements related to citizen compliance with um, uh, with the uh, laws and, and traditions, uh, economic growth and competitiveness are shown uh, leaning to the left, which means that respondents found this much less important. Um, okay, but even with, with all this data, it's still very tricky to see how these views uh, reflect or challenge historical um, ideas about good life. So the real challenge is uh, to overcome the complexity um, and to find patterns in that uh, that uh, uh, that underpin uh, these responses. Now, uh, as you can see, that was too too many statements and. Uh, and it's it's it, you know it's it, it's very it's full of information, but it's hard to work with that, and that's why, especially uh, we researchers and especially in social statistics, we try to find the patterns that uh, that is behind them. So we, we, we fortunately we have methods like factor analysis, and I'll explain to you in simplest uh, uh, way possible that group those answers together, for instance, uh, the ones that uh, correlate with each other, and then they group them under uh, a single theme, and then we can find the, the patterns um, behind these answers. So um, yes, uh, so we used a, a, a program, a software program, a computer program called SPSS to analyze the data, um, and it's very commonly used in social sciences. But what is interesting is the results we found line up with some of the big ideas that I just mentioned before those, you know, intellectual traditions. And this shows how deeply these ways of thinking about quality of life are actually embedded across different groups. But uh, it's more to that. It's not just those ideas influencing us today. So how does factor analysis work? I mean, it's pretty straightforward, but it looks at for patterns in how people uh, responded to our 22 statements when people's answers to different questions tend to move together, it's because they are tied to the same underlying idea. So for example, if someone is strong or, or a good group of people, a good number of people strongly agree with, um, I would say statements like community solidarity and collective ownership, um, you know, the analysis might group those under something that because we are just like community solidarity, collective ownership. That it's, if you see, this is a little bit subjective. We can group them, the, the analysis groups it under one category and leaves this to us to subjectively name it, you know, put a, put a label on it. I would perhaps, we would perhaps call that category or theme a collectivist or communalist perspective. And, and, um, and this way we actually reveal the connections and, and patterns. So let's uh, uh, dive into this. Now, let me first show you this very scary uh, tables. These are the results of factor analysis. I'm not going to explain them to you because it's it's a little bit uh, too, too heavy and too complex for those of us that are not very familiar with the statistics, but you can see those numbers against the statements in, and those columns, those columns are the five dimensions. So the software, uh, the program, computer program found five dimensions that underpin 22 statements. Now, instead of dealing with 22 statements, we're dealing with five dimensions that underpin that. So I turn that to this um, colorful, uh, again, bar chart, down the bottom, you see those, you know, and it's color coded. Down the bottom, for instance, you see uh, blue bars, and the blue bars uh, uh, are the ones that the computer put together as just one category or component number one. And what statements you see in there, greater attention to um, 
play and creativity, greater opportunities for families and community, emphasis on cultural stewardship, greater emphasis on living together, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then you, you read them and you feel that, okay, uh, what is the common theme um, uh, that connects this, this, uh, this number of uh, uh, statements that the computer put together and Hamid colored them blue. And then the second component is the orange one. The top of that, you've got the green one, only three statements in there. And then the light blue ones, and then the purple ones. So let me go, to, uh, go through each one of them um, and explain to you what, what we ended up you know, uh, naming them. The, the, the first component, uh, if you look at them, and, and this, is, this is subject um, to conversation among researchers and, and also their community partners and even activists. So um, I would perhaps we can call that, uh, you know, descriptively, it, it, it seems that they point to kind of an ecocentric, but also communal well-being. So that first category, that first component that underpins people's view about quality of life draws on ecocentric traditions, emphasizes on connection to nature, uh, it's influenced by communalist ideas and focusing on, um, I would say, group well-being and living together. Then component number two, the orange ones, you know, I would perhaps call them egalitarian. And we're very much emphasis on social justice here and representation. Uh, then you've got... Um, um, component number three, the green ones together, when you look at them, it's more about, you know, as you can see, you can read those statements, hopefully. Um, uh, it's about individual satisfaction, personal uh, freedom or choice, and then something like that in ties, liberal traditions and that value, personal autonomy, I would say, and rejects. Um, it's kind of utilitarian but it's not uh, orthodox utilitarian. You see that people have valued personal freedom, but they, they're not happy to impose a one fit all, uh, one size fit all um, way of, um, way of um, uh, delivering happiness for greater number. So it's a kind of a, I would say, less orthodox, an unorthodox utilitarianism, which is kind of uh, uh, being uh, uh, endorsed here. And then uh, component number four, uh, uh, I would say that the, the light blue bars in their statements, uh, it's more about uh, collective ownership, you know, community solidarity and community or, or collective autonomy. Uh, and it's shaped by communalist autonomous ideas, I would say, um, um, maybe um, a little bit anarchist here and uh, and collective control over resources and solidarity, but also connects to socialistic ideas like worker ownership and community, sorry, economic democracy. And then uh, component number five, which is the least favored, as I will show you later, uh, reflects the critique of, um, of the mostly, because it's not very much indoors, I would say, instead of saying, um, showing uh, people's uh, um, uh, uh, endorsement, but I would say it's a, it's a critique of traditional capitalist values like growth and, uh, and competitiveness. Uh, this, this economic growth and competitiveness was not very much uh, favored by the cohort of respondents. And it's very obvious because we, uh, we mostly targeted the progressive ones, but, uh, uh, but there's also still some elements of that um, in their views. Um, I'll get back to this. So yes, these are the five components that I just talked about them. Uh, then you may ask me, well, how popular each one of those components, each one of those themes or dimensions are among the people? How, how much they are autonomous, how much they are communalist, how much they are uh, ecocentric, uh, how much they are pro-growth or against growth? Well, uh, we have things like, you know, these, uh, well, histograms uh, uh, or graphs that you can see, for instance, the, 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 the more bars, the blue bars are uh, clustered on the right hand, of the, uh, right hand side of the graph, uh, the more that perspective or that dimension is favored. So the most favored one, as you can see here, is the most popular one, is that respondents really valued connecting with nature, 
protecting the environment, living in harmony with, your, with their communities, sustainability, and a shared and communal life um, as, as essential. They saw them as essential for, for good life. So this is the most uh, favored. Followed by that, the second most favored, I would say, is the egalitarian one. And a strong support here, people believe in good life, includes um, you know social e including social um, equality fair political representation access to social welfare especially for marginalized groups social justice etc uh, etc et and then you've got the third one uh, again not as favored as the first and the second one not as popular but it's still kind of you know, see that the the bars are clustered in the middle a kind of a moderate support for that. And what is that? It's individual satisfaction and personal freedom. Uh, but, um, um, but these values are, are not that dominant. And many see personal freedom or autonomy as something that should go hand in hand with collective well-being. Uh, and then um, uh, the fourth one, uh, again, this one is uh, also very popular and then uh, there is a strong belief in this one this is collective ownership and community solidarity um, and working together many respondents felt that a good life means shared resources and community solidarity um, and they favored grassroots approaches so this is the level of popularity of that dimension. And then finally, the least favored dimension, uh, which is the traditional ideas of economic growth and competition uh, as, the, as, the, as I said, the least popular. So most respondents really don't pr prioritize growth and competitiveness as part of good life. Instead, they look towards uh, 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 something more than that. So, uh, what do we? What do these results uh, tell us? Well, in just very not nutshell, and just very short paragraph, when we look at all these components together, it's clear that communal, ecological, egalitarian values are the most popular. People in these groups generally favor ideas like working together, taking care of the environment, ensuring social justice. For all. Uh, on the other hand, as I said before, individual satisfaction, economic growth are less important. And personal freedom matters, but it's not central as collective well being. And finally, traditional ideas about growth and competition don't have much support. They are there, but they're not that, that favored. Now, uh, okay. Uh, we might have also realized there is a bit of a hybridity going on here, because as I said before, those five dimensions are components of their mentality, the collective mindset. So they, they all do exist together, uh, despite differences and despite sometimes contradictions, for instance. Um, so... Uh, the actors don't fit neatly into one category. The respondents show that the, the, the responses show that uh, people aren't sticking to a single tradition. For example, someone focuses on environmental justice might also draw on, let's say, ecocentric traditions. Uh, but but they could also recognize the need for social equality uh, policies to support marginalized groups. After all, it's economic justice, right? So you get a mix uh, where ideas like individual freedom and community solidarity are embraced by the same people and same group to different degrees. So instead of boxing this perspective into a strict categories, it's better to think of them as tendencies and, and, and leanings something like that, and, and grasp the high fluidity and fluidity. This one is a selfie of that collective uh, imagination, that collective perspective that is shared across the group. Again, uh, I just, they're, they're the five components, but I replace them with uh, different names here, just to, because to, I'm trying to emphasize the connection between them and those ideational, uh, or ideological or intellectual traditions. Uh, but again, as I said before, they are very much intertwined and supported to different degrees. So this is a radar graph. And uh, as you can see, again, we've got those five components. This time I'm calling them tendencies. 
uh, the, for instance, on the right hand side, you see the, the most favored one because it's closer to the uh, borders, it's closer to the periphery. Um, it's, uh, it's the post-humanist perception of good life, which is around uh, centered around uh, ecological well-being and interconnectedness. Then the second favorite is the uh, on the left-hand side, as you can see, uh, autonomous perception of good life, uh, which is um, focuses on local governance, self-determination, and uh, you know uh, communities uh, controlling and owning their resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then the the third one is the communalist perception down the bottom here on the left hand side uh, about community solidarity and shared ownership. Uh, the, 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 and then you've got the post utilitarian one, which is on the top. Uh, I call it post utilitarian, as I said before, it has it, it's a it's a bit utilitarian, but not that much. It's not that orthodox. So and then you've got the least favored one down the bottom right hand side. It's the economistic perception of good life, which, as, which is which is least favored, and as you said, as as you can see, it's way into inside to the center. Uh, so it's not that uh, that huge. Uh, now, uh, let's um, let's uh, step back and uh, um, and look at the bigger picture of what our findings reveal and how they connect to a more radical vision for transforming society. So. The five key tendencies we identified all point together to a clear shift. Um, I would say away from, yes, growth uh, focus and new liberal frameworks. But moving beyond, beyond growth is just the first step to really address today's holy crisis, as some people call it. We need to dig deeper and confront the capitalist structure that shapes um, our reality. So our findings show real counter and post-capitalist elements in the responses, uh, but I'm not sure if they uh, actually amount to something uh, coherent. That's why we need to complement quantitative research with qualitative research. We need to sit together with those uh, people as, as many as possible. And we did that with 14. They were kind enough to accept our interviews. So uh, participate in our interviews. And so, so to get deeper into, into their minds, it's, it's uh, and actions and practices and experiences. Uh, so quant normally uh, uh, scans the surface, but it scans a very large surface. And qualitative normally gets deep. It's, it's, it's not that vast or wide, but it's deep. So, um, so there is a strong support for collective ownership. And that's something we can consider as kind of a post-capitalist. Uh, worker em empowerment was, was mentioned and endorsed by the people, favored by the people. And people want radical change in how resources and labor uh, are, are managed. So uh, this corresponds to kind of an economic democracy, which is post-capitalist. Next is a big emphasis on ecological stewardship. So people are rejecting capitalist extractive nature, and that's good, uh, and they favor regenerative economy. We also uh, see a push for political and social justice, which demands more political power for marginalized groups, uh, especially First Nation countries, indigenous, and it's about redistributing power and not just wealth. And that's 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 great, that's interesting. And lastly, the capitalist growth model, which was, the, as I said before, least popular. And that's again, it's a, it's a kind of a rejection of, of, of capitalism in the sense that cap capitalism is a system that um, its ultimate goal is, is, is profit, you know, a profit motive. So there are those uh, good and a strong and solid elements of uh, of post capitalism in in the in that kind of uh, mind um, uh, mind escape that we that we that we um, uh, searched or a scan. Um, okay, uh, only two I think two two or three more slides and I end the misery. Um, so uh, let's let's also reflect on the loopholes and gaps. You know. Uh, what are the limitations? Here you see me that I'm actually going beyond the data a little bit, and I'm actually, I, I didn't have time to present the rest of the data and, and the findings. Uh, and also I'm getting a little bit subjective, which is okay as far as I'm 
and transparent, uh, I believe. So we may, I would say um, civil society wise, we have made good progress toward post growth, collective and eco-friendly ideas of good life. And the idea is there, although it's very in contrast with what we see at the elite level. Uh, individualism, personal satisfactions are still valued, which is okay, but it can sometimes conflict with collective vision. And if we're, um, we're not careful, this can start to resemble new, new liberal ideas like consumerism. And it's important to show that individual and collective well-being can go in hand, hand in hand. Uh, I'll give you an example. Many people think that if everybody gets, uh, their, they roll up their sleeves and gets involved in doing something different, finally out of the market of uh, um, this kind of market of great ideas, a, a new force would emerge. That sounds like the hidden hands of, um, or, or the invisible hands of market, you know, Adam Smith's invisible, invisible hands of market. That sounds like a little bit new liberal. There needs to be a layer, a layer of meta activists like the honeybees that go and pollinate and cross fertilize across different views. So the growth dilemma is still there because by and large the court has moved away from the growth narratives with many seeing it as necessary, but not so. There's a bit of a division but between those who say growth is not enough, so let's go for it, but also go for more than growth. So that like, you know, green capitalism or, or green growth and those who are degrowth. And that's one of those divisions. That's one of those gaps or chasms that, uh, that we need to work on. Also, there's a number of respondents that seems that they have, it's only a small number of them that task themselves to, to decolonize. And interestingly, another part of the, the findings actually shows that those who go for decolonization, those who pursue decolonization, are the ones that are most likely uh, take a more holistic view of good life. Uh, and that's, I, I think that's the inspirations and insight they get from the indigenous, because that's how the indigenous people look at the world. It, they are very holistic. And there are also tensions between political representation and collective autonomy in the minds of people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'll skip that. Um, so it's important to also look at the limitations, loopholes, chasms, contradictions in that mindscape, in that, in that collective mindset. Now, what are the implications for actions? Well, uh, these findings actually show that a strong anti-capitalist commons-based and post-humanist values uh, are there. But real transformation needs more than just hybrid ideas. We must build a unified understanding of how capitalism fuels our social and ecological crisis. After all, we're living under capitalism. And, and more than that, it's the unholy trinity of capitalism, modernism, or we may call it developmentalism, and, and imperialism slash uh, colonialism. So that unholy trinity, we need to actually deal with that. Uh, and, and, and shows, I mean, this, this, this data shows that Many efforts uh, are there to challenge capitalism, but the real challenge is how to unify, uh, I mean, unite them or bring them together uh, and in, in kind of a coordinated push. And change won't come from isolated pockets. You know, it requires transformation of society's entire, I would say, value system. Collaboration across movements is crucial. Real progress uh, um, happens when I believe social, ecological, and economic struggles unite. Um, so we understand, I mean, should, I should acknowledge, we understand not everyone can fight on every front and not everyone can share the same values, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's unrealistic to, 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 it's unrealistic to expect that. Uh, but the solution is for movements to work more in solidarity with one another and supporting and amplifying efforts across uh, different uh, causes. You know, a specialization in activism is great, it's necessary, but coordination is also necessary. And that's why the works of organizations like Nina, you know, the network weaving, running biannual conferences, bringing all those progressive forces and voices together to hear from each other, uh, running wor workshops constantly and tirelessly. 
uh, is uh, is great. It's the, it is such efforts like Nina's effort should be supported. And I really invite you to 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 get involved um, and to 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 support as much as you you can. And uh, and also we also need class consciousness and to be a strengthened. Uh, otherwise, we will give it up to the populist, to the far right, to take our working classes with them with those old you know those conspiracy theories, you know, immigrants eating our uh, pets. Um, and um, ultimately, you know, good life is about what society at the end of the day values. Everything boils down to value. And moving beyond GDP, as I said before, is not enough. We must redefine value itself and focus on true value, the one that nourishes our communities and ecosystems rather than fetish value that is about extracting profit. And, and, and the goal is to embrace authentic ways of living. And here is my final uh, a slide, hopefully. Um, just um, let me end this presentation by sharing this uh, a, a famous quote from uh, the uh, Marx and Engels um, um, uh, uh, the the communist manifesto. Your I, I I believe many of you are familiar with that famous quote, but I have reconstructed it and reworked it in my uh, recent books, Capital Redefined, and and, um, and this is a uh, uh, this is how it goes. So the the history of all societies, past and future, is the story of two intertwined yet distinct struggles. The two struggles always happening at the same time. One between the value makers and value takers within the existing value system or regime, okay, fighting over the distribution of value. You know, my wage is not that high, and I want better uh, working conditions, or fighting over recognitions, you know, my identity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is great. But that's just one struggle. The second struggle is which is much deeper more decisive battle is over what should we truly uh, value, what should uh, uh, truly constitute value and, and the way of uh, structuring the system that delivers that value. So that's, uh, that's the fight, that what we really need to value. We normally, when we get too deep into the first fight, we forget the second fight, uh, which is much more essential. Um, so I believe that would capture our challenge today. Um, I'll leave it there. And I, if you're interested, again, I invite you to read especially Capital Redefine and the well-being, and also invite you to, if you, haven't, if you haven't been familiar with Nina, make yourself familiar with Nina and the great work that goes in there. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, I'm Thank done, you. I Thank you, Hamed. Um, if people know how to press emojis, please do press the clap button or something similar. Um, Hamed, we do have a number of questions that have come through, um, and Tiani and I have been trying to collate some of them together. So let's let's make a start. Um, we will finish at, on time at 1.30, so please bear with us. We'll work through the questions um, as quickly as we can. Um, Hamed, just to sort of kick off a, a mini summary from you, um, Miguel has asked, um, how does your research fit into the broader post-capitalist debate? Uh, Can you? Uh, for, for, yeah. Post-capitalist, yeah. Uh, well, um, in, in many different ways, and uh, one is just the empirical part that you just presented a, a bit of that. Uh, I'm very much interested in understanding uh, who is who and, and what are they doing, you know, uh, people out there that would uh, uh, push for, for post-capitalist ways of living. So that's the practical, empirical aspect of it. And I also get a little bit too philosophical and too deep in sometimes in order to uh, look into, for instance, the nature and future and a structure of capitalism, because capitalism has evolved since Karl Marx wrote the book Das Kapital, right? So that's one of my uh, my aims has been actually to, to imagine if Karl Marx was uh, still alive, how would have been dealing with the complexities of uh, of modern capitalism in our time. And I see that there are some elements who he would keep and then uh, uh, in other elements he would, or other aspects he would go beyond. So that's why in one of the chapters in that book, uh, the title is Going Beyond Marx, but with Marx. So I think it's still uh, interesting stuff in there. And I try to 
provide people with kind of a conceptual framework that would bring people together, feminist and, and socialist and anarchist. I hope the work would resonate with them. That actually touches on the next question. You know, what do you hope personally will come from this research? Or what are you hoping that civil society or other groups will learn from it or do with it? Uh, I, I think our job um, uh, intellectually is to provide them with the image. It's like, you know, taking a picture of them. I know it's research is subjective. There's a bit of our subjectivity into that image. It's like every lens is, is like that. And, and, and put it in front of them so they would see each other, they would see themselves where they are located. For instance, if you go to those network analysis or network websites, you can click on each, um, each, each, uh, each node, find your organizations and see how you're connected with others. You know, what are the commonalities you have, common things, you do? what are the values that you share, what are the ideologies, what are the perspectives, learn from each other, find each other, uh, maybe, maybe that would, uh, uh, paved the way for becoming more involved in some joint projects and things like that. Um, so that's um, that's uh, that's what I hope that would achieve. But the real work, the real work, is the one that uh, people like you know in Nina do. Uh, they're they're like uh, as I said, like honeybees. You know, cross fertilization, network weaving. You know, we need that layer, that meta activist, meta ideological level. That even if you have your own ideology, that's fine. That's fine. But still, you need to accommodate for others. You need to help others to work across their differences. See how, how the far right does the job. I mean, it's in the nasty way. It's in the nasty way. But they bring people under one umbrella. Uh, and, but we can do it, if, uh, I think, for much more progressive uh, uh, outcomes, hopefully. Thank you, Hamid. That actually links to three questions that have come through. Um, two people, um, I don't know if they meant to, but they sent me private questions, so they're not visible there. And then one person, this question is in the, the mix there. So you were just talking about how, you know, we need to do it like the right wing groups who have forged together and particularly through neoliberalism, I'm actually paraphrasing and adding, they were able to redesign the world in the late 80s, you know, and that was picked up by politicians and such. Um, one comment um, has been problem with progressives is they're all arguing about their own little pocket of work and they don't band together. Um, the co comment here um, by Claire is interesting. She says, too many views, fragmented movements towards a better society, not helpful when trying to counter the dominant capitalist ideology entrenched for 600 years. Don't we need more solidarity and an overarching goal? Otherwise, we may dither forever. Before you comment on that, Hamid, and what people are thinking, so all this fracturing, all these different objectives, all these different goals, someone else wrote privately to me, but I think they meant to comment to Claire. Um, actually, that's exactly how we're going to break down capitalism. Look at the global tapestry of alternatives. You'll see that the move is towards bioregionalism, localization, not fragmentation, but strength back in bioculturalism. So I think these are some really interesting views, you know, from your research, given there are a lot of different views on how people would explain or describe themselves, do you think there's a strength or a weakness or a little of both in all of these differing views in progressive groups? Oh, yeah, I think uh, it's both. I mean, uh, there are strengths in diversity, the weaknesses in lack of coordination and communication. Um, I personally, always considered myself as a leftist and I run a, a, a course of uh, the title is future uh, societies and it used to be the, uh, the older title was capitalist globalization it was so kind of gloomy and and people were learning a lot the students were learning a lot but when they were leaving the uh, the the course they were just very upset about everything and then i realized well let's let's uh, let's bring some conversation about the alternatives so i allocated half of the second half of the semester to the alternatives and basically i couldn't believe that there were so many of them actually and there's so many great ideas that don't just don't make headlines and uh, and then uh, it was so ed education i was still learning about them I I think uh, when we are in our uh, silos and thinking about a society too complex, too diverse, uh, it's too overwhelming, I'm not going to get involved, I can't really digest that. 
well, uh, that, uh, that would prevent us. But as soon as we open the windows and the doors and get involved, then we, we become more, more open-minded and we, we learn a lot from, uh, from others. And I think that's, that's even activists themselves need to do that. And as, as, as you said, there are also ideas that are more, uh, I would say, general, like bioregionalism. It's a kind of umbrella idea, umbrella framework that brings many views into, into conversation, into coordination with each other. And, and they are there. They are there. And I think diversity, I mean, biodiversity is the strength of nature. And also this ideological and practical diversity is, is the strength of us. But also nature is interconnected. Also, nature works together, every element of it. It's a commons. That's why I, I, I try to push for the idea of communism, not communism, communism. Because if we learn from commons and how commons work, they work in unity, but in diversity. Hmm. Thank you, Ahmed. Lots to think about, I think, for all of us. And certainly, Nina, the New Economy Network Australia, the work of Nina has really shown and we structured Nina to specifically allow for a lot of diversity in the kind of different kinds of work people do and the different worldviews. We never said we had to have a sort of singular view. We just wanted to bring diversity together. But it does it does wage this kind of conversation about well, what's the end game and how are we getting there? Uh, certainly after 35 years working across environmental, new economy, community, uh, capacity, et cetera, decolonization. I think diversity is the reality of life. And as you said, Hamed, nature, nature works in very much. Nature loves diversity. She doesn't like the singular or the uh, uni, the unilateral. But finding that common ground, supporting each other in our different approaches, and really getting specific about the kinds of specific reform we want whilst supporting each other's diversity as perhaps the way we have that patchwork quilt rather than a, a singular nylon doona, if that makes sense as a terrible metaphor. Um, coming into that, let's go to the next question. Um, Neil has said, um, pro-sociality defined as positive uh, behaviours and beliefs, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, pro-sociality, getting communities to do good things, getting people to do good things. He has a question about that. In the context of the rapidly escalating poly crisis and the urgent imperative towards localization, um, do you have any ideas as to how pro-sociality can be promoted at the individual and community levels? Um, that's the basics of the question, and then including intra and intergroup pro-social behavior. And do well, you think demonetization and gift economy would influence it? Oh uh, yeah, I think. Um... Yes, um, but but I can't pretend to that I uh, know the answer, especially for for sociality. I I think that needs to be clarified first. Um, um, yeah, but um, um, yeah, lo localization, those connections are great. But also we've got the globe as a locality as well. So we also need to look after the 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 entire planet as as a locality itself too. So and that would require. Uh, expanding that sociality to 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 across the communities, you know, the relationships between uh, between communities. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't really pretend that I uh, understand that concept very well, and uh, and I can answer that question. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions from Neville, and they're more about research methodology uh, than the content of what you were talking about. Um, one aspect of his question is, uh, does the numbers and machine approach really demonstrate what the research is seeking as knowledge? I know many global philosophers, sociologists, et cetera, in the last 40 years who are still skeptical. There's still a better need for combined qualitative and quantitative research methods. Did you want to speak to that, Hamed? Oh, yes. Our, our research project is a mixed method. Uh, what I presented was just a quant, uh, just a tip of the iceberg of the quant aspect of it. We have interviewed Broward, so looking for some more money and, and opportunities and, and support in order to go through the interviews that we have, they're beautiful interviews. But it's, as I said before, this is a small number. It was a pilot project, only 96 people could uh, manage to participate. And, uh, and so I, I can't claim that I can generalize that to the entire civil so Australian civil society. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a 
it, it, it's a case study in itself. It was diverse enough to give us some view uh, as I presented uh, into the mindset of people and their um, experiences and actions. Thank you, Hamid. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Harry has asked a question. He asked it while you were on slide 22. Uh, what does that scale represent, e.g. 0 0.6 of what? Did you, want to, you don't need to share screen, but would you like to refer back to that? It's a bar chart of pattern matrix or something. Bar chart of pattern. I may have that wrong, but if you want to check slide 22 and just remind us what oh, the 22. scale was. Um, oh, oh, the bar, uh, bar chart of pattern. Uh, yes. Um, do you want me to explain that again? Um, maybe if you can just speak to it very quickly. Oh yes, uh, the the bar chart is um, it was a visualization of the uh, a pattern matrix. The pattern matrix is one of the products of factor analysis that uh, the statistical um, uh, programs do. I I just wanted to visualize it uh, uh, for you guys instead of going through those very boring and complex uh, table of of a pattern matrix. Uh, um, when we do an, a factor analysis, as I said, the uh, the, so, the statistical program looks for correlation. So for instance, if a few uh, statements correlate with each other in terms of people's, you know, people's, uh, when they say I agree or disagree, they get a score, they get a number. And so when those numbers correlate across a few statements, the computer puts those statements together and says, well, I found a component here. I found the theme that underpins this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, group of uh, statements. So that graph actually puts those uh, groups of statements uh, together. And you see it was color coded. For instance, the, down the bottom, there were the dark blue ones, the ones uh, with the dark blue bars. And together, they were, they were considered by the computer program as highly correlated to together as one theme. And then we, and here is, and you can see a statistics is not just about numbers. A lot of subjective and mental work goes into it. And so we sit back and look at the uh, statements that are grouped together by the program and say, okay, well, it seems that this, this group of uh, statements or this group of questions are pointing to this direction or that direction. They're, they're telling us that um, there is kind of, for instance, autonomism going on here or, or communalism going on here. And therefore, we instead of dealing with 22 statements, we'll deal with only five dimensions, like job job satisfaction, for instance. Like, so, you, so you have to come up with some, some questions that would uh, you ask people about, you know, their work Working conditions, their payments, um, their relationship with the management, uh, or their relationship with their colleagues. How collegial are you satisfied with the collegiality of your work? And and see that each one of them is a dimension of job satisfaction. I mean, social social life is very multidimensional. Sorry to take that too much. Did you speak to scale? I'm not sure. If, did you answer the question of what the scale was in that? Oh yeah, the scale was um, a group of statements, 22 statements we put together. We asked people to tell us, to look at each statement and tell us to what extent they think each statement uh, uh, represents the view of quality of good quality of life. Uh, for okay. instance, biodiversity, how important it is. Uh, and if you say it's very, very extremely important, you get a highest the highest score for that. Okay, thank you, Hamed. Um, we don't have time for all the questions, but to wrap us up, because we're almost finished today, um, I might go to Sandy's question. What further research or work has been identified coming out of this research? I'd love to hear about what comes next. Uh, well, what comes next is um, we have to crunch more data. That's my part, part of my job. Um, there are other members that are more involved in the qualitative aspect of it. And it's um, for me, it's very interesting to, for instance, because we, we measured a lot of a lot of things. For instance, what makes some people go for uh, or, or or favor the 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 first component, the biodiversity, or go more ecocentric? What makes people go for uh, 
community autonomy uh, as their own favorite way of um, achieving good life. And then we we'll look at the, for instance, their theory of change. For instance, those who favor more radical change or those who favor more systemic change, would they favor what, what sort of or what aspect of uh, good life they the good good life they would favor as well? So uh, my job is to look into the associations and find the determinants, things that make you more. I don't know, anarchistic, more socialistic, more, more, uh, more comprehensive um, towards community, uh, towards, sorry, towards a good life. What influences, things that influences our views of good life. Great. Thanks, Ahmed. And I think the final question uh, JP has asked, uh, she starts with a quote from wonderful Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde famously defined a cynic as someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. How do you see our global society getting past the cynicism that seems to prevail in modernity? Trust seems to be tenuous now with all the fakery that is possible um, through our digital lives. Yeah, okay, that's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I think we could have spent many hours talking about that. Well, uh, you have two minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, I, I, well, I think Gramsci said uh, the pessimism of intellect and optimism of will. Um, so, uh, willfully, I, I'm optimistic, although intellectually I share that with JP, and uh, and I'm very uh, pessimistic in that sense. But I, that's that's all what we have in two minutes. I mean, one minute. Uh, well, and I was just going to say that I think throughout all of it. Uh, the concepts of localization, bioregionalism, um, making it real by being out there in the world with other people in whatever way possible. That's how trust is built uh, yes. because let's hope we can still trust what we see and feel when we garden or talk to people or interact over the small transactions of life. So I think keeping it real, definitely, as I said before, the Nina approach has always been how do we weave those conversations and connections as best we can um, in a very uh, fragmented and often confusing world. But I think there's some amazing initiatives going on. And certainly Hamed's research has shown how some groups are seeing themselves and seeing the work that they do. Um, and I think that's pretty terrific. So um, in the spirit of good trust and finishing on time, um, we're just about to roll into 1.30. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention today. We're really grateful to you Thank for you. joining us. Um, the recording for this will be available shortly. Uh, no promises on how rapidly that will be turned around. Um, but Hamed has shared very generously in there um, the, the references and such. Huge thank you to Tiana for helping keep track of questions and popping in those links. Um, and, yeah, a final big thank you to Hamed. Hamed and I have been working together on and off. Um, on, I've been the Nina contact for his research, and it's been an absolute delight to be working with Hamed. Um, and seeing where all this research will take us. So I'm looking forward to seeing further outcomes over time. And wherever Nina as a humble civil society network can support your work, um, that would be terrific. And to everyone who hasn't been um, a member in the past, please do think about joining Nina. Um, again, we are a small but humble network trying to do everything that uh, Hamed's been talking about, bringing people together, finding those commonalities um, whilst still supporting and celebrating our differences. Um, so, yeah, on that note, a huge thank you to everyone, and we'll sign off now. Thank you, Hamed. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for being patient with me. All the best. See you again. See you soon. Bye.